this lecture, we're going to discuss microbial genetics. Uh, this lecture is going to be a little longer than the other ones simply because the material is complex and far reaching. The concepts are essential to microbiology, and it may be that you'll need to listen to this lecture a few times, but you will definitely get great uh, rewards from understanding the material very well. So we're going to start off the discussion by bringing back some important definitions, the first of which is what is a gene? And uh, there have been several changes in the definition of a gene. Most recently, a gene now is thought of as a section of the chromosome uh, or a section actually of DNA that uh, encodes the primary sequence of some final gene product, which can be either a polypeptide or RNA. But initially, uh, back in the 60s, a uh, gene was thought of to be a segment of genetic material that encoded for one enzyme. Uh, the theory was called one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Then we broadened the definition to include one gene, one polypeptide. And now we've also included uh, RNA as part of the definition. So genes can also include uh, regulatory sequences, and these are parts of the DNA that are actually there to regulate the transcription of other genes. And these sequences provide signals that denote the beginning or the end or some kind of influence of the transcription process itself or uh, the regulatory sequence uh, functions as a place where uh, transcription is begun or uh, a place where replication occurs or where recombination occurs. So it's also been broadened to include several different things, but basically the true underlying function is in some kind of way it regulates transcription. So the genetic code, we've alluded to this genetic code in a couple of our discussions already. And uh, today we're actually going to clearly define what it means. So in the DNA, uh, the way it's, it works is that each DNA sequence and each subsequent RNA sequence encodes for one amino acid. And generally it takes three uh, base pairs uh, to encode for one amino acid. And depending on the order of arrangement of these nucleotide bases, that will determine the arrangement of the, uh, or the ultimate arrangement of these amino acid uh, sequences. And each of these amino acids are joined by a peptide bond. And depending on which amino acid actually occurs in these various positions will also influence how the protein is shaped uh, after uh, post-translation. So transcription and replication, as we discussed in earlier lectures, is basically very similar to transcription and replication in eukaryotes. So bacterial transcription and replication, as I said, is very similar to eukaryotic, to the eukaryotic processes. So we have uh, transcription and translation occurring here, and we have recombination and replication occurring here. But the thing that is very different about bacteria that we're going to see in the next couple of panels is we can also have gene transfer occurring between individuals of the same generation. So we certainly get uh, inheritance of the uh, parental uh, DNA into the daughter cells, but we can also exchange material, genetic material, between the daughter cells. And that's actually what makes microbial genetics 
so complex. So here we have replication. Okay, remember that word, replication uh, of bacterial DNA. It's very similar to replication of eukaryotic DNA. Basically, we need to copy both sides of the DNA strand. So we get this uh, unfolding or unwinding of the DNA, and we have this replication fork, and then we actually have a copying of both sides of the DNA in the circular motion, and then we basically flip the circles, and then we have a complete copy of the DNA in the uh, daughter cell. Now, DNA transcription and bacteria uh, also work rather similarly to uh, eukaryotic cells, and that's where the DNA ultimately produces proteins, right, according to the arrangement of the nucleotide bases where we talked about uh, in the uh, genetic code uh, slide. So we take DNA and it gets transcribed uh, to RNA and that RNA polymerase binds to the promoter sequence. We get transcription beginning and then it stops when we reach that stop codon or that terminator sequence. So here is a picture of bacterial transcription. So you can see over here this is very similar to eukaryotic transcription and translation. However, there is a major difference. What is that difference? There is no nucleus, okay? So all this needs to go on in the cytoplasm. And, you know, biochemically it's different, of course, but in terms of functionally, it's not really that much different at all. So here we have another slide of the actual process of bacterial transcription. So you can see the RNA molecule is assembling these nucleotides to match up in a complementary way with the information on the DNA strand. And the synthesis, it moves along the DNA and, and then the RNA kind of comes off in the opposite direction and it moves you know, the, the transcription machinery moves in one direction and the RNA uh, moves in the other. So then we get translation. What is translation? Remember, translation is assembling the amino acids into the protein based on the codes that were uh, transcribed by the messenger RNA. So messenger RNA is translated into codons. Remember those three nucleotides and the messenger RNA, you know, starts and then it stops based on that regulatory sequence. So the protein in a bacteria is used for cell metabolism and growth. So gene regulation, how can we regulate all of those processes? We certainly have different kind of genes. So we have the constitutive genes that are just expressed at a fixed rate. They're just continually made at some uh, rate that's fixed. But other genes are expressed only when they are needed. And those genes are called repressible genes and inducible genes. And we're gonna have a little in-depth discussion about what that means uh, just right after this slide. So regulation of transcription is a way in which we can figure out and initiate or stop sequencing, or actually not sequencing, but synthesizing certain proteins. So for instance, if you have a bacteria that produces a toxin, right, when it infects a organism, a human host or an animal host, then that toxin requires the production of potentially some sort of protein substance. And that regulatory sequence on that bacterial DNA will need to get initiated in order for the toxin to pr get produced. So we have this regulatory gene here sequence or 
portion of the DNA. We have this control region. And then we actually have the region of the DNA that's encoded for certain uh, structural proteins. So in terms of repression, we have the regulatory gene actually produces this repressor protein that then lands on the DNA and essentially stops the um, transcription from occurring. So the transcription starts, for instance, and with this repressor protein, it just stops right there and that protein does not get synthesized. And so what protein does not get synthesized is the protein out here. So that's one way that we can actually cause repression or stopping of the synthesis of a particular protein. Now, in terms of induction of that, we can actually have it occur in a couple of ways. So we can either um, have a secondary molecule called an inducer that will land on the repressor protein and actually inactivate it. So that's one way. Another way, there are other regions on the DNA that are actually set up that if something lands on that DNA, that will cause the machinery to start. But in this case, we actually stop the repression and then we get uh, transcription and translation. And then ultimately we get the uh, protein gets produced. And in the case of that bacteria, uh, we, get, uh, we get that toxin, okay? We get that toxin produced by taking away that, the function of that repressor protein. Now, let's talk about mutation. Uh, now, mutation is another concept that's common to both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And the question, again, has arisen for quite a long time in genetics in terms of defining what a mutation is. So Eric Pianca, who was a very famous ecologist, defined uh, a, a mutation as a genetic change to a germ cell. Now, what is a germ cell? When a eukaryotic cell, a germ cell, or in a human host, a germ cell is an ova or a sperm. And when we have a genetic change to, the, to a germ cell, that genetic change is passed on to our offspring. And so in terms of evolutionary biology, that genetic change will either enhance or disrupt a population's fitness to reproduce. So this has an evolutionary uh, connotation. But, you know, certainly these concepts apply to bacteria as well, especially in the case of the uh, antibiotic resistance that we discussed uh, in the beginning of the course. So only germline mutations are transmitted to offspring. Um, Moin Curry, who's another famous uh, geneticist, uh, uh, clarified that uh, terminology. Now, there are also some definitions uh, of genetic mutation in relationship to me molecular biology. And a genetic mutation is, in molecular terms, a permanent transmissible change in the nucleotide sequence of a chromosome, usually in a single gene that leads to a change or loss of its normal function. And again, if we have that change occurring in germ cells, that change is transmitted to all the cells in the organism. Now, the other concept about mutations that's important is that mutations are rare. And also they're random. Now, these mutations can be beneficial, neutral, or harmful. And in the respect that they're random, it's, it doesn't matter if the mutation is useful or not. The fact that it occurs at all, it's a random process. Not all mutations matter. Uh, 
some if they're integral to particular functioning of some protein then they do matter but if they can occur in a part of the dna that's not uh, a gene or not expressed in that particular manner and so in that case not all mutations matter somatic mutations now we were just talking about germline mutations now somatic cell mutations are mutations that occur in cells that are not germ cells they're not reproductive cells and they won't pass on to our offspring so for instance if we stay out too long in the sun our skin cells may have a mutation that's induced in that particular area that got sunburned but the rest of our body isn't going to have that kind that mutation just that part of the body that was exposed to too much sun so the example here the golden color of this apple was caused by a somatic uh, mutation but the seeds of the apple so if we planted this apple if we planted the seeds the apple would not grow into being multicolored it was just that particular apple had that particular genetic change now um, these uh, mutations are different again from germline mutations because germline mutations all of the cells in our body will carry those germline mutations. So what are the causes of mutation? So one cause of mutation is that the DNA does not copy accurately. So remember in cell replication, if our DNA does not get copied accurately, that is considered to be a mutation. So in, that could be even thought of as being random. And uh, sometimes that copy of DNA is not quite perfect. And the difference from the original sequence is considered a mutation. Now, external influences can cause mutations, like for instance, radioactivity, uh, also chemicals, uh, other environmental exposures, heavy metals, certain endogenous factors, these agents cause DNA to break down, various poisons. Um, and, you know, we have these other mechanisms that actually can repair the damage that's caused by these mutations. So if the mutation escapes this repairing, then that cell, especially if it's a germ cell, could go on to produce a mutation in the offspring. So uh, this then is considered a mutation. Now, there are different kinds of mutations. You can have a substitution mutation where one nucleotide base is basically substituted for another. And so, for instance, we could change an A to a J. And you might think, well, you know, gosh, here what, what we have millions of nucleotide bases. What's the deal if we change one? Well, in some cases, actually, that can make a huge difference. So one really good example is sickle cell anemia. Now, sickle cell anemia is uh, a function of the actual shape of the erythrocyte uh, generally, the shape of the erythrocyte is round, and if you look at it kind of as a cross-section, it has an indentation, and the shape of that erythrocyte is very specific to being able to carry oxygen. Well, with sickle cell anemia, the shape is not quite the same. It's actually sickles uh, in shape. And what causes that sickle cell anemia is actually one base pair that is wrongfully substituted. And that changes actually the amino acid sequence for the uh, hemoglobin molecule. And because of that, uh, we get a sickling uh, of the erythrocyte and then the oxygen is not carried efficiently and we have sickle cell anemia.
So uh, there are other examples. So we can have, like we talked about before, we can have a mutation in an important part of the gene, or we can have what's called silent mutations that occur in portions of the gene that don't encode for any particular protein. So, um, but you can also have a mutation in the stop codon and potentially terminate the uh, synthesis of a protein early and make it incomplete and then potentially lose the entire function of uh, the whatever protein process uh, that occurs. Uh, so there are other kinds of mutations. There's an insertion type of mutation where you get additional base pairs inserted into the genome. And you can have a deletion where you get some nucleotide bases uh, deleted. And you can see that it makes a difference in terms of the sequence of nucleotide bases. And that certainly can go on and change the sequence of the amino acid in the protein. So there are other kinds of mutations. There's what's called a frame shift mutation. And a frame shift can happen, for instance, if you have one base pair deleted, but then when the um, uh, DNA is replicated or transcribed even, it shifts the whole uh, reading over and uh, what was one amino acid sequence now becomes something different. And these are called frame shifts, and, and it's a great example above in terms of that. So it's just like with words, if we don't, uh, if we omit a letter in, um, you know, this particular sentence or part of a sentence, then it changes the complete meaning of everything. Um, so these codons are not are not parsed uh, correctly, and uh, that changes the protein or potentially causes it to lose its function. So how do these principles apply to bacteria? So that's what we're going to utilize the last uh, latter half of our lecture today, is thinking about how these principles apply to bacteria because the ways in which these um, bacteria replicate and pass DNA between uh, bacteria either across generations or within the same generation is really what makes bacteria such a challenging organism to fully understand. So we can have different kinds of genetic recombination in bacteria. We can have vertical gene transfer where just like in eukaryotic cells, we take the the parent uh, cell, and then we pass the DNA completely to the daughter cells. But then we can have this situation where we can have horizontal gene transfer, where the genes within the same generation can transfer. So for those of us who have siblings, right, uh, it would be the same thing if, if our siblings, or we could exchange DNA with our siblings and end up with all kinds of different uh, characteristics that weren't inherited uh, from our parents. So genetic recombination, just, you know, in general, in both kinds of cells, is when you have crossing over. And so you have a donor DNA and you have the recipient chromosome. And during uh, meiosis, when these genes segregate to the various daughter cells, you can have a situation where you get this chromosome breakage. And then you can have a piece from one chromosome going to the other. And essentially, you get an exchange of uh, these pieces of chromosomes. So then the new uh, recombined version now has a pink section in the gray uh, chromosome and a gray section in the pink chromosome. Now this is all very simplified, but this is exactly what happens uh, with recombination. And you can uh, have these characteristics that wouldn't normally occur except for this process of recombination. 
So a very similar thing can occur with bacterial recombination where we have this, we can actually have DNA fragments now. We're not even talking about cells. We're talking about fragments. These DNA fragments can get taken up into this recipient cell. And then these DNA fragments can combine with the, uh, the chromosomes or the DNA from the bacteria. And then now we, instead of having this A, uh, gene, right? Now we have a little a gene, and so that little a is going to produce a different protein than the big A did originally, and it's because these DNA fragments migrated from donor cells, migrated in um, to this recipient cell, and we saw this recombination. Now here's another kind of genetic exchange, so to speak, and this is an actual dramatic one. It's called bacterial transformation, where we actually have qualities from one bacteria uh, taken up or, or basically an exchange occurring, and the whole bacteria uh, essentially transforms. So, uh, and this is an example of a particular way of testing uh, how bacterial transformation occurs. So we have this uh, condition over here where we take living encapsulated bacteria that is lethal to the mouse. So we inject it into the mouse and the mouse dies. And then we isolate these colonies of these bacteria from this dead mouse. And now we take living non-encapsulated bacteria, which is benign, okay, and we inject those bacteria into the mouse, and the mouse survives, and we colonize uh, those uh, bacteria, and then what we do is we take this encapsulated bacteria from that we got over here, and we uh, heat kill it, so we take away the lethal properties. We inject it into the mouse, and there were no colonies isolated. The mouse re remained healthy. Now we take living non-encapsulated and heat killed encapsulated. So basically, we're combining uh, these two here. Okay, we're combining these two. Uh, types of bacteria, and then we're injecting it into the mouse. Now, clearly there was an exchange between these two bacterial types, and now we have a lethal, uh, the, so the lethal form or the lethal property uh, combined with the other uh, benign bacteria, and now we have the back, uh, now the mouse, uh, so, so essentially this produced a fatal form of the disease. So it's because we had actually a transformation and, well, we had an exchange and then we had a transformation. So another property of bacteria is the, is called conjugation. And we talked a little bit about this in an earlier lecture where we actually exchange uh, this plasmid. Uh, and so here we get this F factor plasmid that gets uh, replicated and passed over to this uh, other uh, bacteria. Remember the pili, that's what this structure is here. And uh, so we can get a recombination so we can actually exchange the plasmid, and we can also, down here, we can actually incorporate the plasmid into the bacterial chromosome. So, uh, and this is just another picture of another way that we can have conjugation. So we can have replication and transfer of part of the chromosome, so we can have a, a gray, the gray part of the chromosome being replicated, and then it's actually incorporated uh, 
into this recombinant uh, bacteria. So this is another way that we can interject uh, a chromosome and DNA from one bacteria into another. Now here's another way that we can have uh, what's called transduction. And transduction happens by a bacteriophage. Now bacteriophage is thought of as a virus to bacteria. So basically we have this virus, right, that infects a bacteria and that phage actually uh, injects its phage DNA into the uh, bacteria. And so then uh, the bacteria uh, replicates, or, or actually the phages all replicate within that bacteria. And not only does the phage uh, have its own DNA, but then the phage uh, also takes up the DNA from the bacteria. And then the phage goes to another, uh, you know, uninfected bacteria and it injects or it carries the bacterial DNA and infects a new host cell. And that new host cell now has part of that donor bacterial DNA that came to the bacteria through a bacteriophage. So when we get to the virus uh, lectures, we'll see that eukaryotic cells can incorporate viral DNA as well. Uh, but in this case, we're actually transmitting uh, uh, bacterial DNA to other bacteria uh, organisms. So this is another way that we can transfer DNA. So let's talk a little more about plasmids. So what are plasmids? They are a self-replicating gene that contains circular, uh, excuse me, circular pieces of DNA okay, that exist independent of the bacterial chromosome. The F, so there's several kinds of plasmids. The F factor plasmid is a conjugative plasma that carries genes for pili for the transfer of the plasmid to another cell. So basically the, the gene carries its own machinery for transmitting to other cells. Now, other plasmids encode for proteins that enhance the pathogenicity of a bacterium. So E. coli pathogenic plasmids enhance the toxin production and bacterial attachment. So we can have benign E. coli, and then we can have E. coli that uh, have this pathogenic plasmid. And once they get the pathogenic plasmid, then they can be uh, disease producing and they can enhance uh, toxin production and bacterial attachment to what? To the actual intestinal epithelium. Now we can have dissemination plasmids that encode for enzymes for catabolism. Okay, so these plasmids actually cause uh, a breakdown of some sort of, of uh, um, other kinds of molecules or proteins. And then we can have these R factors. Now these R factors are called Rs because they encode for antibiotic resistance. So remember the R factor is a type of plasmid that when it gets encoded into the genome, of the bacteria can actually cause the bacteria to develop uh, antibiotic resistance. So antibiotics, so in other words, if we have, right, our antibiotic uh, lecture, if we have, uh, uh, we're giving antibiotics to our patient and we eradicate all bacteria except for a few, and those few happen to have an R factor plasmid, we can transmit that R, right, to bacteria that don't have R, uh, 
and then we can transform those bacteria to actually be now resistant to the antibiotics. So this is actually a really important uh, mechanism that we're trying to understand better to deal with this antibiotic resistance. Um, so then there's another concept called transposons where we get it's a lot like that recombination example that we saw where we can cut out one gene and we can insert it for another. And in this case, this is another mechanism where we can introduce resistance. So these segments of DNA can move from one region of DNA to another. And uh, in order for that to happen, we need to have this particular DNA enzyme that can cut the DNA and cause this transposition to occur. And this, again, is another way that we can introduce these traits uh, into bacteria. So here we show, here's the transpose uh, gene, and uh, it, the ends of it get cut. And then they come back together, and lo and behold, we now introduce this new type of resistance gene. And that is a way in which we can introduce uh, antibiotic resistance. So we've covered now several ways in which this recombination and exchange of genetic material can occur uh, between bacteria of the same generation and, of course, the traditional way of passing uh, across or, or actually vertically going from one generation to the other. So what is the process called where we have a pathogenic and a non-pathogenic bacteria combining to produce a lethal combination? Remember the mouse example that is called bacterial transformation. Okay, that's important. The thing, the way um, you need to study this uh, material is by fully getting an understanding of how they work and then classifying like the several different types of recombination, the transformation, the different um, vertical gene exchange, horizontal gene exchange, and so forth. So the next example is what type of mutation it, do we have where one base exchanges for another? Remember that was substitution. Is that important? Yes, it is. Remember our example, sickle cell anemia. It's very important. But it can be silent, too. It can be silent. Or, you know, or if it's in a sequence that's uh, uh, red, you know, in terms of uh, replication and, translate and transcription and translation, then that can certainly change the function of the protein. Now, the third example, which type of transfer results in the exchange of genes among cells of the same generation? Okay, so you got to remember, there's, hor there's vertical, okay, and vertical pertains to parents and offspring. And horizontal, right? refers to exchange of genes from the same generation. So that's a way in which you can distinguish between the transfer of genes. Now, as we have discussed in today's lecture, there are several ways that you can have this uh, horizontal transmission. Remember, there's plasmids. Okay, and then there's those different types of recombination. Okay. Okay, and there's the transpose, transposons. Okay, so these are just some of the ways in which uh, bacteria can exchange DNA. So that'll, that's it for today.
Thank you very much for visiting educator.com. We appreciate your input and your attention to what we have discussed.